Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today, we're going to talk about the four levels of manifestation. This comes from an amazing book called The Laws of Manifestation by David Spangler, who was the founder of the Findhorn Foundation and created some great schools for spiritual education. In our ongoing quest to fully understand this advanced level of reality creation, we must discuss all the laws, all the authors, and the dynamics of manifestation. And David Spangler addresses the four levels of manifestation, which is very helpful in understanding its dynamics and flow. He begins by saying, man's consciousness functions on different levels, and the way in which an individual perceives and interprets life and the universe depends on which of these levels or combination of levels predominates in forming basic attitudes and ideas. Where the consciousness is oriented will determine how the individual will understand and work with natural law, although the essence of manifestation is basic to all levels of life. How the processes of manifestation are approached and utilized, the mechanics of manifestation depends on a person's level of consciousness. An understanding of this throws light on what is meant by old and new laws of manifestation. The physical level is experienced by everyone, and it represents our most obvious level of manifestation. On this level, physical energy expended through some form of labor is the means used to bring manifestation about. We call this working for a living. For example, to manifest bread, we plant wheat seeds, grow the wheat, harvest it, process it into flour, make the bread dough, bake it, and so forth. We now use machines to expedite many of these stages, but machines are also a form of physical energy. Money is a symbol for physical energy that also expedites the manifestation process by simplifying or eliminating the system of direct bartering of concrete goods. On the physical level, we work very obviously with laws in order to accomplish manifestation. These are natural, economic, religious, and social laws. We do not consider them to be supernatural. Natural law dictates that wheat, not corn, will come from wheat seeds. Economic and social laws describe the flow and manifestation of money, prestige, and culture. Religious laws tells us how we must behave in order to manifest the good and righteous life. The source from which manifestation comes is also seen in terms of these laws. We acquire what we want from nature, from the economy or society, or from God through these laws and because of them. These laws represent the middle man between ourselves and the source, the means by which we can relate and receive from the source after having expended the appropriate physical energy. On the religious side, an example of this is seen in the doing of good deeds or good works in accordance with the precepts and laws of a particular religion in order to receive blessings from deity. God is seen and understood through his laws, and our relationship to him is one of obedience to his laws within our physical life. Thus, we may be enjoined to eat certain things but not others, to wear certain kinds of clothing, to do certain things on certain days or at certain times of the day. Faithful observance of these physical rituals will result in a manifestation of divine favor. In any area, these laws are concrete, dealing with tangible, demonstrable, observable realities and processes and can be understood and related to by consciousnesses conditioned by the concrete form nature of physical life. Manifestation by means of these laws does not require an abstract or speculative awareness, only a willingness to expend physical energy through the appropriate form of work and labor. The process of manifestation is given a new dimension when the energies of the emotional realms are added. Naturally, thought and feeling are involved in most kinds of physical action and work, generating the incentive, the desire, the direction that can stimulate and channel physical labor. As we are using it here, however, the emotional level of manifestation refers to the use of feeling energies directly and physical energies indirectly in order to bring about a desired condition within one's environment. This often involves the manifestation of things which seem beyond the scope of our physical endeavors. This might be the manifesting of health when physical medical attention is not available or is ineffective. This is faith healing. It might 
also be the manifestation of needed supplies when the apparent resources available to be tapped through physical work are not sufficient. An example of this would be a case where an individual needs a sum of money more quickly than he can raise through earning it, or perhaps beyond the reach of his salary. Following the injunction in the New Testament to ask and it shall be given unto you, and with an attitude of faith in God's abundance, the person places his need into prayer, then releases it. Subsequently, he may receive a check from a relative or friend, an unexpected gift that meets his needs, or he may be prompted to read something or go somewhere to meet someone, and through this is put in contact with an opportunity to earn the money. The operative factor in this kind of manifestation is faith and the energy of devotion. God is seen as a loving parent, a father or mother, who knows the needs of his or her children and can supply those needs. Prayer or affirmation, faith in God, and an openness to God constitute the working of the laws of manifestation on this level. This does not replace the physical level. Faith is not a substitute for work within the concrete world. Instead, it enhances labor and expands its effectiveness. Where there is faith, there is trust, security, and a lack of tension or worry. Work becomes a joy, and one is more open to being guided into the kind of labor that is truly fulfilling. Keynotes to this level of manifestation and the consciousness required to work its laws may be found in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 28-30. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not. Neither do they spin, and yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which grows today and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? What man is there of you, who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone, or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If ye then, being of human limitation, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Faith in God, our Father, and placing our requests in prayer to him, knowing through faith that he will meet our needs, thus releasing the problem to him, this is the essence of manifestation, through devotion and the energies of the emotional level. One other point should be mentioned here. The energy of emotion is the fuel for this level of manifestation. This energy can easily be expressed as desire and fear as it can be expressed as faith. Thus it may be used for negative results. Worry can be as potent a form of faith as prayer and can trigger the laws of manifestation with consequent effects of an undesirable nature. The laws of manifestation on this level are neutral and will draw to us according to the seeds of desire, belief, and attraction that we plant. Faith is quite different from hope. The former partakes of knowing and is consequently powerful, able adequately to release the energies required for manifestation to take place. The latter partakes of not knowing. It is not a single pointed expression of consciousness for it admits of fear and an acceptance that perhaps manifestation will not take place. This lack of unity dissipates energy, providing no fuel for the engines of manifestation. Faith by contrast is one-pointed knowing. This one-pointedness or concentration is a key to manifestation, as indeed it is to all forms of creativity. Compare the difference in force between a spray of water covering a wide area and a stream of water concentrated through a hose in one direction. The ability to give definition and form to energy is essential to manifestation on the planes of form, body, emotions, and mind. It is in fact essential on all levels, but particularly where concrete manifestation is required for obvious reasons. Concentration and direction greatly magnify the power of subtle energies to affect changes on physical levels. True faith is such a concentrator of emotional energy, raising it to a high level of affirmation and potential activity and influence. When to faith one adds knowledge, then the power of concentration is enhanced manyfold. The mind is the instrument of concentration, definition and form building in the subtle realms, particularly through the power of the imagination. When this instrument is plugged into the powerhouse of emotional energy and faith energy, then the powers of manifestation are greatly increased. The ability of using the mind to create the channels 
of positive thought and directive imagery through which the subtle energies can flow with magnified power for thus concentrated is the essence of mental level manifestation. A child, in order to be fed, clothed, housed, and cared for, need not know what kind of job his parents have, nor the details of their work. It is sufficient that he knows their love for him and is secure in knowing that through that love his needs are met. As he grows older, though, a greater knowledge of the working of the family and of society, of the laws by means of which the family itself manifests its needs and from which manifestation his needs are met, is necessary to prepare him to take his responsible adult place in the world and to build a family of his own. It becomes no longer sufficient that he simply acknowledges his parents with respect and love and trust in their care. He must learn the principles of life under which they work and apply them himself. His attention is shifted from seeing his parents as source to seeing the workings of the laws by means of which his parents accomplish their manifestations that through understanding and participation he might realize within himself the qualities of the source. This step in the life of a child is equivalent to the step a soul takes when it begins to learn the laws of mind and to apply them as to enhance the working of manifestation. On this level, the image of God, the source, is less that of a being apparent and more of being a universal mind. Further, man sees himself less as a child and more as an emanation of divine mind. Blind faith, though powerful and effective in its way, still often sees God and man as separate beings, with the latter dependent on the former. In this, faith has an inherent limitation in learning the proper use of the mind, however, man becomes increasingly aware of his own divine powers and of his essential kinship with God. The unity and oneness of the universe becomes more real. The hermetic axiom, as above, so below, becomes a key to knowledge, enabling man to find correspondences between the laws of the universe and the laws of his own being, enhancing his understanding and utilization of both. With this awareness of inner divinity and of working in harmony through one's own mind with the laws of divine universal mind, the techniques of manifestation on this level revolve around the right use of thought. Thought is the process of creating images and forms on the mental plane. These forms, which may be concepts, pictures, or words, can then be used to concentrate and direct energy and deliberate the power of will. On the level of the personality, will is the result of an energy flow concentrated in a one-pointed fashion. Will need not be generated through tension. In fact, straining will dissipate energy. Will is generated through the relaxed yet single-pointed use of the imagination to form an image and to summon all the forces of consciousness to flow into and through that image for a certain period of time. Will is a force, but it is a force created through concentration, not through pressure or strain. This is very important to understand, for willpower is regarded as a key element in the processes of manifestation as directed from levels of the mind. True will is not force or pressure in its nature, though it may be forceful in its impact. Where pressure exists as a source of will, one can usually find a sense of fear, insecurity, or doubt that a certain manifestation will take place. This makes the individual turn on his will in order to try to force events. Then will is used as an energy of domination, of trying to bend events, people, or circumstances to one's will. Even when that will may be used in service to God. The true willpower that lies behind effective manifestation is based on knowing absolutely that a certain manifestation will take place. In this, it is like true faith. This gives a sense of serenity and peace, of non-reactive inner stillness, which can therefore be a source of great power, for no dissipation is taking place. This flow of power can then be concentrated through the vehicles of mind, emotion, and body. It is this concentration that reveals the will, giving it its often irresistible qualities and its appearance of great force. The essential nature of this kind of willpower is that it does not dominate or manipulate, it clarifies and vibrates through a situation making possible the revelation and unfoldment 
of the perfect divine pattern inherent in that moment. It strikes a note to which lesser sounds can align themselves to form the chord of manifestation. It is like a magnetic field around which filings can arrange themselves. It is like a sound wave that causes sand particles to form geometric patterns corresponding to the crystalline properties potential within them. This concept of the unfolding and revealing quality of will may be compared for deeper understanding with what was said earlier about manifestation itself. It is a means of turning potentiality into actuality by drawing out of a situation or person a deeper or higher aspect that was inherently there all the time but obscured by the outer appearances. Another useful seed thought for further meditation is the esoteric association of the energy of divine will with the creative spirit and essence of beingness itself. And that quality which in one of its aspects we call will is at the core of existence itself, lying at the heart of the mystery of divinity and of the primal manifestation of creation. The energy of will brought into play through right concentration is at the center of all manifestation on every level. It is the seat of being around which all else can coalesce and take form. On the mental level, this energy is brought into play through right thinking, through positive thought, the use of the imagination to form clear, precise images through one-pointedness, which in group work means unity of the group mind and imagination and affirmation. Manifestation is affected through the mind of man working in harmony with these laws of universal mind. The next level of manifestation is the soul level. This is the dimension of the new age consciousness. Before discussing it, however, there are still certain points to clarify concerning the dimensions of mind, emotion, and body. Together, these make up the personality level in esoteric concepts. The personality is not the identity nor the individuality. Though it thinks it is, it is actually a complex of energy which provides a certain kind of learning and growing environment, in some ways like a greenhouse, within which the true individuality may unfold. A characteristic of this environment is that it divides the universe and beingness into an inner and an outer reality, a subjective and an objective state. In other words, the veil of the personality separates creation into me, what I am, and it, everything else. This sense of personal reference causes the soul to experience creation and life with greater intensity, leading to greater self-realization. Thus, from the level of the personality, we experience our world through a subject-to-object relationship. We do not so much come into oneness with other elements in our world as that we form combinations of relationships with them, creating complex forms. We own things, are near to things, are distant from things, work with things, but always our experiences are colored by our basic sense of separation through our personality from everything else. Even so-called personality affinities, if expressed only on personality levels, do not represent a true oneness, only an intimate combination. Manifestation as expressed by the personal becomes an exercise in the invocation of things, including people, which are understood as being external to the individual. This means that a sense of separation, even of lack, underlies all forms of manifestation operated by a personality oriented consciousness. We are manifesting things which are separate from ourselves and which we do not have at the moment. Otherwise, why would we be manifesting them? This may not be a despairing sense of lack. We may know how to get something. Nevertheless, we begin with a basic idea that we are separate from the thing or person we want. This is true even when we are manifesting subjective states of consciousness. When we begin the process of manifestation, we feel a lack of the consciousness we are seeking. It is only later, as we begin to experience and grow into the newer state, that we realize that lack was only an illusion, that the consciousness we sought was within us and part of us all the time, only obscured by personality factors. In this sense, we might say that many forms of manifestation, if not all, consist really of a process of stripping away that which prohibits or clouds realization of what is there, rather than in drawing something to us. The core of working the laws 
is basically an overcoming of the illusion of separation and overcoming of the limitations of the personality consciousness. Before the individual can understand the deeper process of manifestation, which relate to the very nature of his beingness and divinity as well, much less use those processes to the fullest extent that is possible. He must transcend the limitations of the personality self. Manifestation is essentially a means by which God expresses himself. It is revelation in action, rather than a means through which one can acquire things, which is how the personality consciousness, even with the highest of motives, tends to interpret it. To work the laws of manifestation is to participate in divinity and should be an experience of deepening soul contact and understanding not only a method on outer levels causing the attraction and precipitation of desired items, but more importantly, revealing more to the individual about his basic divine nature, his oneness with the whole. Seeing manifestation as simply a means of getting things is to rob the process of its vital meaning and educative power to transform consciousness and to make it only a shallow process of power manipulation of events and things. To open up the greater potentials of both the divine consciousness of the individual and the laws of manifestation as they emanate from and express the beingness of that divinity within the soul requires transcending the separated personality self and moving into the consciousness of the whole, thus to move from the level of personality manifestation using the laws and energies of the physical, emotional, and mental realms. An individual must understand and apply certain bridging principles which will lift him to the level of the soul. These principles are basically those which deal with the giving up of the energies of self-will, of loosing the bonds of the personality complex which are formed through desire and of learning to merge oneself into the consciousness and rhythm of the whole creation. This corresponds to the process of the fourth initiation, the death of the personality and the rebirth of individuality into the greater body and life of the soul. It is also symbolized in Jesus' life as the Gethsemane experience expressed in the words, Not my will, Father, but thine be done. Thus, these bridging principles involve the giving up of the personality self, the transmuting of self-will and desire into the vision, motivation, and will of our soul's divinity. It is learning to put God and the whole first, and through this coming to learn of one's inseparable identity and oneness with the whole. It is learning to love as the whole loves its parts, not as separate elements, but as unique elements within a single unity. As these principles come to live more and more within a person's consciousness, he begins to participate increasingly in the viewpoint and attitude of the soul. The soul is group consciousness. Though aware of its unique individuality as a center of divinity, the soul is also aware of the essential energies of unity that sweep through creation. It perceives distinction and difference, not division and separation. Further, just as a basic need of the personality is to attract and to acquire, the basic need of the soul is to serve. The personality is the instrument through which the individuality draws nourishing experience to itself. It is an agent of in-breath, speaking generally. The soul is the instrument through which the individuality externalizes and reveals its divine nature into the realms of form. It is a vehicle of outbreath, of causation. Thus, the soul is called the causal body, with intuition being its basic mode of perception. These differences between the personality and the soul profoundly affect the attitude toward and the utilization of the processes of manifestation. A certain intuitive insight, a reading between the lines, is necessary to understand causal or intuitive manifestation. For language does not contain concepts to describe this level accurately. Certain key words or phrases can be used as seed points for further meditation, but some form of illumined thinking, tuning in, or meditation is required for the intellect alone cannot fully grasp the working of dimensions which are above it. There are certain things that can be said which will suggest what intuitive or soul manifestation consists of. In the first instance, the consciousness that is conducting manifestation from this level 
is at least tuned into the perception and viewpoint of the soul. The soul perceives oneness. It sees others, not as separate entities, but as self manifesting in a different form. Thus, the soul forms what we would call subject to subject relationships in relating with the universe. It is relating with itself and it knows it. This leads naturally to the realization that the soul does not experience lack in the way that the personality does as a sense of separation from a desired object external to itself. Consequently, manifestation to the soul is not a means of attracting that object. What the soul does experience is potentiality and actuality, and the work of its consciousness is to transform the former into the latter, to externalize from its divine center the qualities of that divinity and to express them through form. The need and interest of the soul consciousness is not how to draw things to itself from the environment, but how to draw out from itself the qualities and energies from which a greater environment can emerge. The process of manifestation becomes one of externalization and realization. It is one of giving, not of receiving or taking, of revealing and releasing, not of attracting. The soul is not a center of invocation, but of evocation. It's like a portal through which the divine can emerge, can move from one level of reality to another, as long as the soul is radiating its energy of being in this fashion giving out in manifestation of what it is in actuality and potentiality, then it is being true to its creative nature. Energy is released, which will automatically build up about the individual complementary and supportive patterns, which meet the needs of enfoldment for that soul. This is the energy of will. We have already discussed that will energy lies at the core of creation and manifestation. It is the emanation from being itself. Its nature can be suggested in the statement, as a man is, so does he create his world. Whatever we do on any level must reflect in some manner our nature upon that level. For example, we can often judge what a person is like by the environment in which he lives, the way he decorates his home, the clothes he chooses, and so forth. Will is the energy that motivates creation and naturally what we create is always a reflection in some fashion of what we are or think ourselves as being, or for that matter, are trying to make ourselves become. The source consciousness of will energy is the consciousness that knows I am that I am. It is born from the divine center of wholeness. Thus, will is never separative in its essence, though it may be destructive in its impact upon form, destroying that the life within may be released to grow. Will does not act from a center of energy upon external things. Will does not manipulate within a subject-object context through force or domination. The true energy of will manifests the power and rhythm of beingness, and everything that is attuned to that quality or characteristic of rhythm will be attracted and will align itself accordingly. Will creates through revealing the nature of the source and the center, the ultimate authority. Rather than acting as a pressure upon the surface of things, it acts as a magnet drawing the comparable divine nature from out of the heart of things. Will is a causal energy, not a reflected one. By this is meant that the energy of will proceeds from itself, from the essential character of the being that is its source. It does not proceed from reaction to external experiences coming to that being. For example, if I know I cannot eat a certain kind of food which I like and it is served to me, I say that I have used willpower to refuse to eat it. What I am really doing is to use a force to separate myself from something that I am identifying with through desire. This is not true willpower. True will is born from right identification. If I do not identify with the food in question, if I stop desiring it and seeing it as a part of me, then I automatically can pass it by. This involves no strain, no tension of refusal and frustrated desire. It is an affirmation of being. Another example would be when a person reacts to obstacles that prevent him from reaching his goal and uses his will to push through them, feeling the tension of the overcoming. There is no tension involved in the use of true will, for there is no tension involved in being oneself. The reason that most people do not have access to the true energy of will to use an enhancing manifestation on all levels is they do not know who they are. Will, we said earlier, proceeds from concentration. To the soul level, energies are concentrated through identification, the knowledge of 
who I am. When consciousness is confined to mental, emotional, and physical levels, it is surrounded by many forms of energy and life, about itself and within itself. The problem of identity is acute. Men use willpower as a means of trying to discover and affirm identity, for it has been long recognized that a man who knows who he is has a self-assurance and a power that others do not. The reason is simple. His energies are concentrated around that sense of identity and its expression are not dissipated through conflicting self-images. If creative power can be liberated by a strong sense of personal identification, imagine the power released to the person who knows his soul self, his divinity, his changeless I am, when people are faced with temptation and must use will to overcome it. In reality, they are still attempting to decide who they are, what is part of their being and what is not. When a person knows himself and knows the energies that are attuned to him within creation, then he is not tempted. He draws or manifests to himself only that which is in reality an extension of him. It has been said that the secret behind intuitive manifestation is simply to be. This is true, but this must be understood as referring to soul being, the state of consciousness that is one with the whole, one with God, one with the greater self. The personality is a collection of ever-changing states of being, reflecting the energies of the environment as the individual reacts to the world about him. One must use the fire of discriminatory light and will and intelligent wisdom to determine the nature of one's real beingness and to affirm it. Through discipline and casting all else aside, this is not creating separation, for discrimination leads one to the heart of essential beingness, where the individual is at one with all things. The person who accepts everything as being right and admits any experience into his life is a tool for he is confusing acceptance of all things with being the oneness at the heart of all things. Failing to discriminate on the level of form, he may lose attunement to the level of true substance and essential reality. In so doing, he cuts himself off from himself and from the source of his greater manifestations. To sum up this discussion on soul-level manifestation, it should be realized that we are dealing with a level that is abstract and beyond static form a level where the consciousness and the energies it expresses are more attuned to pure being and identity and are relatively free-flowing. Yet to tap soul levels, one must have a soul-attuned consciousness. One cannot reason or think one's way to such attunement. Logical analysis and mental processes can only take one so far. Then one must launch through meditation into formlessness. One must allow one's soul, the presence of the God within, to speak to one, not the other way around. The energies of the soul are not there at the disposal of the personality. Indeed, they only become fully available when the personality is attuned to soul consciousness. The key to these levels lies in seeking first the kingdom of heaven, of putting God first, of seeking to attune to his will, which is, of course, the same will and spirit of being that is each person's own true identity, the I am that I am. The personality attracts things to itself. Through manifestation, the soul unfolds the divine presence using manifestation to create forms that give God birth. The personality attunes to the surface and shapes and forms of things. The soul attunes to their essence with which it is at one and manifests that essence through identification and attunement. This essence then creates its own form upon mental, emotional, and physical levels. Thus, the individual becomes not a center of attraction, but a portal, a center of evocation, of revelation of being, through which the presence of the whole God can manifest himself. In this way, the source of manifestation is seen as the oneness, the state of identification between the soul and God, this cooperative creativity. It is synergetic divinity through which the unity of individual soul plus the whole creates a revelation of divinity which neither could accomplish separately. So this is discussing consciousness and its different levels, emphasizing how an individual's perception and interpretation of life in the universe is shaped by the predominance of certain levels or combination of levels of consciousness. It explains that where consciousness is oriented determines how an individual understands and works with natural laws. The essence of manifestation is basic to all life levels, but the approach and utilization of manifestation processes 
depend on a person's level of consciousness. This understanding illuminates the distinction between old and new laws of manifestation. Spangler describes four levels of manifestation and the corresponding consciousness levels to work these laws. The first level is physical experienced by everyone, where physical energy is expended through labor to bring about manifestation. This level includes working for a living and involves natural, economic, religious, and social laws. Manifestation on this level is seen as a process involving concrete realities and does not require abstract or speculative awareness. The second level is the emotional level of manifestation. This involves faith, having faith. It involves the manifestation of things which seem beyond the scope of physical endeavors. It might be the manifesting of health when physical medical attention is not available. And then the third level of manifestation is the mental level. It's the ability to use the mind to create channels of positive thought and directive imagery through which the subtle energies can flow with magnified power for being thus concentrated. This is when we start to begin with the concept of inner divinity and will. The final level is the soul level and that involves simple beingness. At the soul level, you're not actually manifesting or creating or attracting anything. You're simply identifying it as a part of yourself. Each of these levels has a power to manifest and we have all manifested on different levels. A really interesting observation here is that the process of manifesting is acknowledging something that is separate from you, when in reality there is nothing that is separate from you. So on a small level, when you first learn about the law of attraction, maybe you watch The Secret or read a book, then you're identifying things that are separate from you and you're trying to manifest them into your life. Then. It becomes emotional where you have faith that you can have this thing, which can be very powerful. Then it becomes identifying your divine power within. And then it becomes identifying that you are one with the whole, that you are God level. Each of these levels is powerful, but I believe that we can manifest at the soul level right now because we are becoming aware of who we are and our identity as divine beings separate from our simple personality, which limits us is where the true power is at. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to The Reality Revolution.